Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive, and we're here in Dobbs Ferry at uh, this wonderful facility, Hudco, which is a very innovative work environment. Uh, it's been a, an, an entrepreneurial effort and uh, done a tremendous job in this area and across uh, these Rivertown communities. We're here today to uh, give you your weekly update. We had daily updates, but now we've reached a point where we'll keep you posted every week on the status of the coronavirus outbreak here in Westchester County. I'm joined by a number of my partners in government, the local elected officials, and we're going to hear from them uh, in a few minutes after we go through our uh, distribution of uh, the PPE that's with us here. But we are joined today by Supervisor Paul Feiner from the town of Greenberg. We have with us the mayor of our host community, uh, Vinny Rosillo from Dobbs Ferry. Where's Vinny? There he is there, Mr. Mayor. We have Mayor Nikki Armacost from Hastings, Nikki right behind me, and uh, Mayor Nancy Kabulian from the village of Ardsley. So, a little further behind me. We're going to ask each of them to say a few words uh, in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> we're here today because we're um, providing for uh, this organization through the Rivertown's Chambers of Commerce, a variety of personal protective equipment, uh, which is uh, part of the ongoing things that we need to have in order to protect our employees and by extension, uh, business um, uh, visitors for uh, this coronavirus outbreak. We all understand now the importance of wearing a mask. We each take it off when we speak publicly, but we'll put it back on most of the time to try to reduce the spread. We've had success in uh, New York State in general and in Westchester County in specific, but this is an ongoing battle every single day. We are not out of the woods. We are not in a position where we can be cocky or confident that uh, tomorrow things won't spike unless we continue to show intelligent diligence. But by making this PPE available to small businesses, we're trying to give them that extra assistance that will help them serve their public better and give people confidence that within reason they can come back out and, and engage in the marketplace. Because one of the things that has come along with this virus is not only the public health crisis, but a financial crisis for individuals, for small businesses, for large businesses, for not-for-profits, religious organizations, governments were all suffering from the shutdown of the society. The shutdown necessary in order for us to deal with the pandemic, but as we slowly try to come back from that, we have to make sure that people feel that they've got the protective equipment they need and to provide it uh, in an appropriate way. And I wanna, as I have before, publicly thank Bridget Gibbons, who's our Director of Economic Development. This was her initiative to uh, make sure that uh, we provide PPE to small businesses through the Chambers of Commerce. We've done it through uh, religious organizations, trying to reach some of the poor communities in our uh, community. Uh, in the town of Greenberg, as, as uh, the supervisor knows, uh, we were over in the Fairview section a few weeks ago to give out PPE uh, to some of the religious institutions that, that cover the Fairview area. But it's important for us to show support for our small businesses as well. Many of them are going through a very difficult, a very trying time right now. And some of the work that Bridget and her team has done is, uh, has really been exceptional. One of uh, the people that works with her very closely is Shari Rosen Asher who has been our liaison with local chambers of commerce. She's done a terrific job. We had no prior roadmap for a position like this. Sherry's jumped into it full force. And uh, we're also in her hometown of, well, hometown, but in the town she's lived in for the last number of years, Dobbs Ferry. She's still a Brooklyn girl at heart, but she's happily a Dobbs Ferry girl as well. And so we're happy that Sherry's on our team and, and part of our effort here. I also want to recognize Ellen Hendricks, who's with us. She's our assistant, um, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, she lives one town away in Nikki's town in the in a village of Hastings on Hudson. And she served uh, as a member of the uh, Greenberg Town Board as well with Paul uh, last year, a year ago at this time. And, and we're always happy when Ellen is part of these efforts as well. So uh, the important thing is what we're trying to accomplish here. And so I'd first like to recognize and ask to say a few words, Dr. Nitin Gupta, who's representing the River Towns Chamber of Commerce. Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Mr. Latimer. My name is Dr. Nathan Gupta, and I am the owner of Rivertown's Pediatrics here in Dobbs Ferry. I'm also the business uh, representative of the Rivertown's Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I, I thank you, uh, Mr. Latimer and uh, New York Presbyterian, for bringing us these PPEs. Uh, as a physician, I want to remind uh, the people of the Rivertown's that it is safer now to come out and dine in our downtown restaurants. It is safer to get takeout. It's safer now to uh, shop at our retail businesses that are providing uh, curbside pickup. 
and also uh, due to the uh, recommendations from our Department of Health, our County Department of Health and CDC, it's safer to come outside again. So thank you very much for the generous donation of all the PPEs. And uh, as, as we've been thanked for our role as a conduit for these things, uh, let me thank uh, very graciously and invite her to say a few words, our partners at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, with us today is Ellen Bloom, who's very active uh, in the New York Presbyterian Hospital network. She's based at the, uh, the, the facility in Northern Westchester, Putnam, that serves that area. But uh, they also have uh, affiliations, uh, involvements with Lawrence Hospital, New York Presbyterian Lawrence Hospital in Bronxville, uh, and uh, in White Plains as well, and they, they really provide a tremendous medical benefit to the residents of Westchester County, and Ellen personally has been very active in these efforts, and we're very grateful for her personal involvement and the involvement of her organization. They've made a donation of 5,000 masks and 5,000 face shields, which is really very essential material in order for us to function. So Ellen, on behalf of a grateful county, thank you, and please share a few thoughts with us. Thank you, County Executive Latimer. We are honored and privileged to be able to collaborate with our community and to bring the abundance of masks and shields that we have obtained into the community members. Our goal is always to support health care. And as um, County Executive mentioned, we are at Hudson New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley, New York Presbyterian Lawrence, and the Westchester County Beha uh, Westchester Behavioral Institute. And all of us combined have been making a concerted effort to do as much outreach into the community to help to serve the residents and make sure that health care is, is available and quick and um, making sure that everyone can get what they need. And for us to be able to deliver the masks and shields is just a privilege and an honor for all of us. So thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you, and again, thank you, Ellen, and all the leaders uh, at New York Presbyterian. We deeply appreciate your help and volunteer help and also the professional work that you do. In a time of pandemic, uh, we lean on the hospitals and the other medical facilities to help us get through this, and, and your organization has really been terrific, so thank you much for that. We have with us a number of businesses uh, from this area, Dobbs Ferry, and I assume surrounding communities. Behind me are representatives. Rather than me turn around and try to figure out where they're standing, they can wave their hand to the camera. We have Maurice from Sam's Italian Restaurant in Dobbs Ferry. Since I love to eat, any of the restaurants are always welcomed in my uh, radar screen. Lisa Zaharko Globenfeld from Chelsea Dry Goods, located in Hastings on Hudson. There we go. And now you know who's from Hastings, so you can loop in to come visit and buy. Lauren Kardish from Play Dates for Pets in Ardsley. Lauren, nice to see you. Jason Brantman from Broadway Training Center of Westchester in Hastings. Broadway training, make a note. This is the next career. We want to thank uh, uh, especially Hudco for giving us this beautiful space. Uh, we've been here before with our Element 46 incubator program that Bridget launched, and, and I've, I've been here to get a tour. It's a fabulous location, and uh, they, they comfortably mix life, well-being, work, all in the same area. It's beautifully uh, lit area. Uh, and uh, this is a members club for Westchester professionals. It, it allows them to be productive, to be inspired. And I think any of us who are involved um, in these communities, we're, we're particularly impressed when we see adaptive reuse of a facility. I come out of the hospitality business and during my tenure in that industry, we were able to adaptively reuse certain buildings that were intended for one purpose into a different kind of uh, hospitality purpose. When you walk in here, you imagine what happened in these rooms previously and how this now has a new life, a second life, if you will, under the vision of the founders. Judy Hadid, Christy Nell, who also serves in public office, Christina Cohen, and Catherine Bagby. And uh, I think we owe you a round of applause for what you've accomplished here. <laughs> Ladies, congratulations. So uh, since June, which seems like 10 months ago, uh, the county started working with chambers of commerce and built, uh, business improvement districts throughout the county to provide PPE for our small businesses. Only businesses with 20 or less full-time equivalent employees were eligible to apply. It's a very simple online form. Uh, we, last week we handed out some uh, material in Yonkers and in White Plains, 800 masks, 
435 face shields about for 60 businesses in Yonkers, and in White Plains, almost 1,500 masks and 750 face shields uh, serving 96 businesses in White Plains. Here in the River Towns, 300 masks, uh, 188 face shields, and uh, overall, it's 727 businesses, 5,100 employees that have been benefited by all of this material. Each of the businesses will get a census bag filled with the amount of PPE that they ordered. And they specifically came up with a number, masks, gloves, face shields, hand sanitizer. Um, it looks like a math question that's in front of me if each box has so much. I don't know if I can answer that question, Professor, but the bottom line is each of these have been put together specifically for the organization, and uh, we will invite uh, them to receive that um, as soon as we finish uh, sort of the press conference in general. But it's very important to note that uh, this is our way of recognizing that with the public health pandemic comes an economic challenge for our businesses. Um, not only has Bridget and myself and Shari, we've been in uh, other private sector entities, Ellen Hendricks has as well. So we're not government officials that are unmindful of what pressures this had made on the business community. And each of the mayors who are gonna speak in a second, the supervisor, they are responsible for governments, but their communities don't operate unless their business communities are thriving and vibrant. And so that is the partnership between business and government that we're showing here today that hopefully were helpful. I don't wanna make this more than it is. It's a good step, it's a good thing to do. And we just want to try to be mindful in other ways so we can be helpful as we do these things. And I do want to point out that the bags that these things come in highlight another one of our important projects, Westchester Census 2020. Uh, we're counting all the residents all across the United States. It's, it's the decennial census that comes up. And uh, Westchester County is trying very, very hard to make sure that everybody who legitimately lives here is counted in the census. There are certain things that uh, when we apply for grants, uh, that population matters. When we allocate certain resources, population matters. Uh, when they uh, carve up uh, representation in the House of Representatives in the, both houses of the New York State Legislature, the Westchester County Board of Legislators, population matters. And, uh, and I'm happy to say that communities like Hastings on Hudson have exceeded the goal that they had uh, from 2010. A number of other communities have as well. We're hoping to get everybody there and, uh, and accurately count the number of people in the county. So we have these bags that are, have been provided free and uh, that's, uh, that's the packaging which this has all been done in. So uh, before I let everybody sit down, we go to the other part of it. I'd like to call up uh, our um, partners in local government. I'll start with town supervisor, Paul Feiner. I'll invite the other mayors to stand socially distanced as best as we can with him and then we'll introduce each of them for you and invite them to say whatever they'd like to say. Mr. Supervisor, Paul Feiner. Th thank you for inviting me, and I was just um, thinking uh, if uh, the rest of the country did what Westchester and um, New York did, um, we would have this pandemic under control. And if you just compare what's happening with us and with the rest of the country, they're not acting responsibly, and I really appreciate the fact that you and the business community um, and the governor are being proactive and recognizing that the pandemic is, um, is not going away right now. Uh, we all have to wear masks. Um, we all have to social distance. We have to comply with the directives and recommendations of the health departments. And if we do that, this could be manageable. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank our business community for, um, for leading the way and um, in being responsible on um, local businesses, and we're going to try um, encouraging our residents to um, support our local uh, merchants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, next, our host mayor of Dodge Ferry, Vincent Russell. Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank everyone for coming today. Welcome to Dobbs Ferry. I especially want to thank the county executive for taking the time out to visit Dobbs Ferry and all the other elected officials and businesses to take the time to come and, and address this very important issue. Um, the businesses of our downtown are key to the success of our villages. And I think um, to have you know, these kinds of protections available is very important. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. And welcome to Dobbs Ferry.
Thank you, George, and thank you, Vince, for hosting us here. Uh, also to the Chamber of Commerce for uh, its leadership on this important question of how do we make our businesses work in this incredibly difficult situation. But most of all, uh, in addition to all the thanks that everyone else has given, a special thanks to all of our businesses for their incredible creativity in coming up with new ways to do business, whether it's creating a parklet on a street, whether it's organizing staggered seating, whether it is uh, setting up an online store for the first time. You guys are innovators and we deeply, deeply appreciate all the work that you have put into continuing to serve our communities. So thanks to everyone. Next, the mayor of the village of Arslan, Nancy Kabul. Good afternoon. County Executive and his team, I'd like to thank each and every one of you from the beginning of this pandemic right through this state with your leadership and your thoughts and your hard work and your innovation. You always kept the safety of each and every one of us and our residents in mind and always focused on what we needed to do to get the county back going and particularly in connection with our small businesses. I will mirror the statements of uh, the mayor of Hastings. Thank you to all the small business, businesses. But I would like to thank all of our residents who supported all of those small businesses during this difficult time, ordering out, sharing information about who's open, and continue to support us because they are the foundation of each and every one of our villages. So thank you again, everyone. Let's keep a mask on. Let's stay safe, and let's keep up the good work. Next, I'd like to invite to say a few words uh, our uh, partner, who's the majority leader of the Westchester County Board of Legislators. She represents this area, very active for a number of years, and uh, leading the Board of Legislators uh, as the majority leader, Mary Jane Shimson. Mary Jane. Thank you, George. I would say welcome to the River Towns, but you practically live here anyway, so we don't have to. Um, we don't have to treat you as a guest. You're basically. You're basically home when you're here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, 145 Palisades very much for hosting this wonderful event. And it's very important for all of us to remember that especially our villages and our small towns will only survive as long as there are vibrant business centers. And there's been a lot of hard work, a lot of creativity, and a lot of hope and optimism that has helped keep our businesses open during this pandemic. Of course, we don't know exactly when it is, quote unquote, all going to be over. But um, until it is, we're going to need all the masks we can get. We do have, I think, one of the more compliant areas in terms of mask wearing, which is very useful and very helpful and help keep us all safe, healthy, and alive. But um, the more we get, the better, because, because they are pretty sturdy masks, but they don't last forever. So thank you very much for this initiative. Thank you very much for re recognizing the hard work that our small businesses and the river towns are doing. And thank you very much again for the masks. Thank you, Mary Jane. I want to give everybody a chance to take a break. Feel free to break out from here, sit down, relax, and uh, you know, at ease, or whatever they say in the military, so that you're all relaxed. I'm very appreciative of our partners in government, our friends in business, and from the chambers as well. Uh, ladies, we're still on, ladies? Ladies, we're still on camera, so you want to do that over there. Thank you. But uh, we appreciate being able to um, have all of these folks together. And I'm going to ask you, please, if you will, if you have any conversations, do it in the rear of the room because we're going to continue the update uh, so our folks can know where we stand on the coronavirus. I do want to point out one thing that's pretty obvious in general. You, you watch government at lots of different levels. We're, we're a local level of government in the county, but what you see today is partnership, not partisanship. You don't see levels of government, town, village, county, arguing with each other. We have our differences from time to time. Uh, the different communities compete in certain ways as well as cooperate. You'll see uh, business, 
uh, the, uh, the private sector, major medical facility, um, and we're finding ways to work together. And, and one of the things that I'm most proud of during my uh, time in county government, having served as a municipal official, and having served as a state legislator at various other times in my career, is our desire to work together to solve problems across those dotted lines. It can be done. We're doing it every day here. We have not accomplished all the things we set out to do, but I think we're on the right path. And I know that there's always a temptation to fight and to play partisan politics. You see it at some higher levels of government. We're avoiding that here locally. We're working together, and hopefully that's a good sign. So thank you again for all the folks who are here today uh, to deal with this. Let me uh, highlight, as we do in this update, and now that we're doing them once a week, you're getting a snapshot of where we are on a Monday. Things happen that differ during the course of the week. We indicated when we stopped doing the daily updates that we would give you um, uh, other than a once a week update if circumstances warranted it. So over the course of the last week, we've seen a little bit of oscillation in the numbers. Generally, we continue a downward trend from where we were at our peak, which was the end of March, the beginning of April. But on any given day, depending on what happens in a particular spike, or the particular unique situations, the numbers have not always been a straight down where they go up a little and come back down a little bit and so forth. Where we are today, on this date, Monday, July 13th, is we have 529 active cases of coronavirus in the county. We have overall 35,327 people that at some point in time since March 1st have been tested positive for coronavirus. The vast majority of those people have gone through the two-week incubation period, have come through it, and uh, uh, survived or, or did not get significantly sick. But currently, 529 people that have tested positive have not yet gotten through the two-week period of time. There has been some uptick on given days. If you go back to last Wednesday, we had 557 active cases, so we're down almost 30 from where we were on Wednesday. That was the peak in the last two-week period. We've actually been lower than 529 on certain days over the last week, but what we're watching for are trends. It's not just wherever the number is, particularly for day. And we're looking for significant variation. If we go up more than a few cases above or below, then we know that we've got to be able to address it. If we went up to 600 some odd cases, then we'd be seeing something significant that we'd have to act on. It's also the geographic distribution of cases. I use those communities that begin with a P because it sounds good when you're talking alliteratively. But if we look at, in the corners of the county, Peekskill in the northeast corner of the county, Pelham, uh, northwest, Pelham in the southeast corner of the county, uh, Pleasantville, a little bit above Central, Pound Ridge to the east of that, Port Chester, further east and south, those are different parts of the county. And if we see increased numbers of cases all over the county, that means we're watching a broad-based trend, not just a spike. We had a few weeks ago, now three weeks distant, a spike in Chappaqua. We believe that spike has, uh, has run its course. It, it reached at 1.27 additional positive cases. That's been absorbed in the number of total positives, and it's been absorbed in the number of active cases. The good news about the Chappaqua spike, which tied into uh, a group of graduating high school seniors, their graduation, more likely the field night event that they had after that, um, none of those individuals wound up being hospitalized, and therefore none of them wound up suffering a fatality, which are the ultimate things that we're trying to avoid in the way we deal with the pandemic. Severe illness, hospitalization, fatality. So we're, we're comforted that that is a good sign. We have now tested, as of today, 320,070 individuals in Westchester County. There is some duplication in there. Even if it's a few hundred, it's a very small percentage of the total. 320,000 tests in a county of a million people. That, that's easy math. That's 32% of the population, just shy out of one out of every three people in Westchester County have been tested as to whether or not they have the COVID virus. Over 85% of them tested have come out negative. And that is a very good sign as well. If that percentage was much higher, then we'd look at that and say it's running rampant. That's what's happening in Florida and Texas and Arizona right now. We went through a period of time like that, but we've come down from that peak, and that is a good sign. It's not a reason to be cocky, but it is a positive sign, and we take it as a positive sign that's important. Also a positive sign is that we've had no overnight fatalities last night, and we have now had over the course of the last month almost as many days with no overnight fatalities as we have had fatalities. Uh, for those who may see some of the Facebook postings that I do, um, I track back to those peak weeks. We had nights of 25, 35, 50, 72 on the peak night of individuals dying overnight. 
So when we say that we've had no overnight deaths, we had two the night before, one a night of zero, uh, th those are encouraging numbers. It's never encouraging to lose even one person, but we are much, much better off than we were over that period of time. And, and that's what we all worry about for our, our neighbors who live in Florida. I don't, you know, I mean, I know politically the nation's divided and blue states, red states, and all that. But they're fellow Americans in Florida. They're fellow Americans in Texas and in Arizona, in Mississippi, and in these states now where this is raging. We don't, we New Yorkers don't want that to be the case. We don't want them to suffer what we went through. We want them to be able to, to, however, do the behavioral things that we have forced ourselves to do. Wearing a mask is not a political statement. I don't care what anybody thinks. It's not a political statement. It's a matter of public health. And if you've ever seen one of those um, um, uh, photographs that show what it looks like when a person breathes and what that looks like across to another person, if each person is wearing a mask, they protect that area in the middle from any transaction of COVID. That's the purpose of what we're trying to do. And I'm, and I'm confident to say that's why we've had the result we've had, not because of what the government does, but because what we as individuals have done. We understood this was serious. And if you believe in economic development, and we all do standing here today, the way to have the economy reopen is not just by a government saying, we open this industry, we open that industry, is that people feel safe when they go back out into the public. They feel safe to go to a restaurant, indoors as well as outdoors. They feel safe to walk inside a, uh, a retail store of maybe some you know, modest sized space. And they, they feel that there's that opportunity for them to resume a normal life. And they can do that and they can do it safely because the fear of this disease is significant and we've lost enough people, 130,000 in this nation. That is, that is serious, 130,000 deaths is every single man, woman, and child in the city of Mount Vernon and the city of White Plains at the same time dying. That's what 130,000 people is. That's a serious number of deaths nationwide. And we hope that the states that are now going through the height of infection will not have that type of an experience. But we don't have a vaccine. We do not have an antiviral treatment. There's no other answer. And I don't care if you're watching somebody speak from the White House or any other place in this country. There is no other answer than self-discipline, and making that sacrifice, and it's hard to make that sacrifice in July. Wearing a mask is not fun, it's hot. We don't want to do that. But what you want to do and what you have to do are two different things. And, and I think the fact that we've had some success here, we hope we'll continue to have that success given the numbers, that is the mission that we're on, to try to do those things intelligently. We can't let our guard down, and certainly we're going to try very hard in our responsibilities as a government not to do that. Having said that, we have opened up some of our park facilities in Westchester County. We've talked about this in past reports, and we're getting a good response. <clears throat> Saturday, as one example, had some rain in it, so we didn't have uh, the kind of turnout that we wanted to have. But over the last month and a half, we've opened our two beaches in Playland in, uh, on the Sound Shore and Croton Point Park on the Hudson River, a little further north of where we are now. And then we've opened in sequence our four public pools at Saxon Woods and White Plains, Sprain Ridge Pools, which are not far from here on the Hastings, Greenberg, Yonkers border, Tibbetts Brook Pool in the heart of Yonkers, and Wilson Woods Pool in Mount Vernon close to the Pelham border. And in opening those pools, we had a very difficult, very hot weekend, very hot uh, sunny Sunday. We had, just for the numbers, 676 people at Croton Beach, 2,086 people at Playland Beach. At Saxonwood Pool, morning and afternoon sessions together, over 1,500 people. Sprain Ridge, morning and afternoon session, over 1,400 people. Nearly 1,000 people at Tibbetts, 991, and 545 people at Wilson. When you add those numbers up, those are the people that we were able to serve to provide some relief from the heat, but to do it responsibly by sanitizing surfaces, encouraging and requiring masks, requiring social distancing on their blankets, wherever they were. But things that were necessary and doable in order for people to, to start to live their lives, but at the same time, reduce the spread. <clears throat> We've reestablished Bicycle Sunday now two and a half months ago. We were able, through the generosity of the Moriarty family, uh, the Westchester Parks Foundation, and Con Edison to extend that through Sundays in July and August, which is not normally what we do. We had over 1,000 people participate in Bicycle Sunday, but socially distanced, to the greater extent, not universally, to the greater extent wearing masks. And we think that that is an example of a, of a good recreation that keeps people um, uh, hopefully helpful. We had uh, 8,000 rounds of golf this week in our six public golf courses. Golf is a socially distant sport by nature. Try getting close to somebody teeing off with a club in their hand and you get a sense of why you need to have more than six foot back 
uh, you know, backing away from them. 8,000 rounds is a, uh, is a terrific recreation for those people who find that recreationally. We've opened up our camps at the various nature centers, Lenoir, Marshlands, Cranberry Lake, they're all, they've been sold out. We did have some rain last week that washed out days, and we do not have an indoor version when it rains because we know that indoor is more hard to protect kids against the coronavirus. So we cancel it when it's, when it's a rainy day, but we've been able to reopen our day camps and at a lower percentage of the number of people that are attending. All of that is important, and we're very appreciative of our staffs. We know that we've closed things. We've closed Playland Amusement Park for the season. Uh, we are not having the ethnic festivals at Kensico, the movies that are outdoors for people to gather. So we've had, we have drive-in movies. This is a throwback to a different era. This Friday night at Kensico Dam Plaza, we have the first of our drive-in movies, and it's already sold out. In fact, it sold out 15 minutes from when we opened up. It's The Secret Life of Pets. And uh, this is the first one on this Friday. We have a second one coming up in, um, in mid-August, August, August 14th, uh, 14th, and the tickets will go on sale for Wonder Park. And these are obviously movies targeted for kids. I'm a little past the point of not only being a child, but being the parent of a young child. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna assume these are really good movies for kids and you'll wanna be part of it. We're waiting to make some announcements in Playland. We've set aside July 24th and August 7th for drive-in movies at Playland. And we also hope that that will be part of what will be a good recreational experience. Uh, I just wanna to touch on a couple of other uh, housing, a uh, couple of other county issues before we uh, break off since this is a weekly update. Uh, we still are working on affordable housing issues in Westchester County. We've targeted about 1,400 units of affordable housing that we're working on. We opened up some units in New Rochelle uh, earlier in our administration. We're now on the cusp of uh, opening the uh, project, which you may have seen if you saw my update about uh, a month ago in Port Chester on South Regent Street. They had a lottery for applications. We received 371 applications for 34 units of affordable senior housing. Uh, so that is uh, very exciting, and that occupancy is going to come up this fall at that location. Uh, the, the Mayfair site, West Help site, uh, that's, that lay fallow for eight years now, uh, has been under construction. It's um, on budget. It's ahead of schedule. Applications will start later this summer. That's 75 units of affordable housing here in the town of Greenberg, although uh, a little distance on the east side of the town, and we're very happy to do that. And we are going to try our very best, even with the COVID crisis, even with our financial issues, to deliver on our commitment to build affordable housing, or to help build affordable housing across this county. Uh, the issue of police reform, social justice has been very much on our minds. Uh, we have impaneled, I announced it at a previous update, that we have a police reform and reinvention task force. It involves uh, people who come out of the police community, out of the social activist community, members of the clergy, uh, people with prosecutorial and legal background, uh, certainly those from the African American community and those that are of other ethnic uh, uh, backgrounds to try to come together, work on this, analyze different areas, and, and help us improve the things that we do right now in training and education, in accountability, in transparency, in a host of these different areas. They had their first meeting last week. They have uh, some public hearings that are coming up. Uh, in which we invite the public at large to participate in and share their thoughts. And uh, this committee has a task and a due date of uh, December 31st to deliver uh, the, the, the contents of a plan that will help us move forward as a county to implement legislation, executive orders, change in policies departmentally as a response to what we've seen. Also, our Human Rights Commission is involved in the public education side of these issues, and they uh, have uh, started a series of virtual discussions. Most of what we're doing is electronic these days. Uh, their program will be this Thursday, the first program will be this Thursday at 6 o'clock, 6 to 7.30. Uh, it's on acknowledging racism and building a path forward. Uh, that's a virtual discussion. Uh, you can uh, contact us at uh, westchestergov.com for more information, Human Rights Commission, or you can call our office at 995-2900. We'll get you the details. This Thursday, July 26, 6 to 7.30, we're fortunate to have as panelists State Senate Majority Leader, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, who represents this area from Yonkers and leads the New York State Senate. The mayor of the city of Mount Vernon, Sean Patterson Howard, will participate. Mayo Bartlett, uh, Esquire, who's a civil rights and criminal attorney, a former prosecutor, and he's the co-chair of our uh, uh, reform and reinvention task force. Ken Jones, who uh, is also a lawyer by profession, Legal Aid Society, and he's also a member of the Greenberg Town Board. Uh, 
uh, and uh, they will be part of the panel that will be discussing the issue of acknowledging racism and building a path forward. And this is the first of a series of discussions by the Human Rights Commission. Uh, in the next few days, uh, we'll come back and share with you uh, some of the things that we've identified as a strategy to work with our Board of Elections to uh, try to make sure that we have a, uh, the best possible result in November for our elections. Uh, there was a public hearing last week that the Board of Legislators conducted. It highlighted some of the problems that were experienced on primary day. And so we want to try to have a positive response to these problems. Uh, within our authority as an administration, neither the Board of Legislators nor the County Executive's Office can dictate to the Board of Elections. They report to us as a state entity. But uh, we've offered some very concrete things. We'll talk about that a little bit later this week. Uh, we'll also talk about a program we have for rent assistance, eviction, eviction provision, uh, protection that we think are important as well. But we'll, we'll try to save those content pieces for standalone uh, public efforts and answer questions on those things. With that, I'm going to check with Catherine Chaffee to see if we have any questions remotely from the press. We Catherine? We do. We have one question from the Journal News um, in reference to the number of cases from the Chappaqua cluster. Are you surprised that the number stayed at 27? Um, no, I'm not for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, the, the mechanism that's in place today is much greater than the mechanism we had in place, which was uh, when we were surprised by the first case that occurred back in March. When the first case appeared back in March, we did not have the ability as a local entity to test for COVID-19. We needed to get CDC to allow for states to be able to administer testing, much less bring it down to the local level. That didn't happen until about 10 days after the first uh, designated case in Westchester County. Now we have this cluster and we have easily available COVID-19 testing. So anybody that had contact with a person who was initially infected could be tested quickly, and then we could size up how many positives we had, and then we can impose isolation on those individuals and try to reduce or stop the amount of spread. So that's an advantage we have now. The second advantage we have now is a system of contact tracing, which did not exist you know, fully so at the time of the first outbreak. And contact tracing is the detective work in which a trained professional and we've had now 800 people trained to be able to do this work, could be able to talk to an individual who's infected, identify who they may have had significant contact with, and then reach out to those individuals to try to get isolation or testing, and then reduce the spread. The spread happens when a person has the disease, generally is asymptomatic, doesn't know they have it, they interact in the society as they normally would, without benefit of a mask, without a benefit of any protection, and they then infect other people, and this is how the thing grows from one to 100 to 1,000. So we were able, because we had those things in place, to look at the Chappaqua spike. It, it had an impact, but it didn't have the impact of turning into 1,000 cases. Now, as I said earlier, we're looking for geographical impact in these things as well. And if we see that there's a spike, and depending on who is exposed to that, if it were to happen at a festival where people might come from 30 miles around, then we would worry about the broad-based spread, and that spread could go into all four corners of the county. This happened to be a high school graduation and an event uh, after the graduation itself, which was heavily populated by people from one community, and then some involvement from people from the two or three communities that ringed that. So that's why I think we were fortunate. I don't think it was because of our unique skill and talent, but we were fortunate that the spike occurred the way it did. We were aware of it. And the, the individual person who came back from Florida <clears throat> who became symptomatic after these events was, was uh, wise enough to report themselves. And therefore, we knew that we had an outbreak and it didn't languish another two or three days. So I'm not uniquely surprised if there is a word to use. I'm appreciative. I'm appreciative that the system worked in this particular way. It may not work like that in all of these cases. And that's why I think what, what uh, Dr. Gupta said when he was here, uh, it's very important for us to understand that, that we don't have control over this, but it's what we do every day individually and collectively, that will solve the problem. No other questions. With that, I want to thank, once again, Hudco for hosting us. I want to thank uh, our friends here in uh, the village of Dobbs Ferry for uh, being so gracious to have us here. Uh, we do try to get around the county. I know every good restaurant, Dobbs Ferry, Hastings, Irvington, you name it, I've been there and I'm coming back uh, as soon as they open the doors. But uh, <clears throat> we are a diverse county, but we're still one county. 
And, and if you're watching this in any of those communities, uh, this is a, we're all part of the same broader community. We work together, we do the right thing, we'll get the right result. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Thank you for watching. We are planning to be with you a week from today to give you another update at two o'clock. We'll give you a, uh, an update on an interim basis if there's a reason to do that. And we will come back on a couple of other issues over the next few days and uh, uh, try to provide you some information that's helpful. If not, otherwise, take care, stay safe.